Welcome back, Commander. Hit it. Sir? Clear. Orders moving out. Yes? Yeah, sir? What? Yes, sir? Medic! Move, move, move! Incoming transmission. Hi, I'm Lewis Castle. I'm the co-founder of Westwood Studios. I'm here to talk about Tiberian Sun, which was built by a team of people that had built many RTSs in a row, and it really shows in the way they innovated and pushed the edges. New construction options. Man and Conquer was really the uh, the second game that we had done in the real-time strategy genre at Westwood. Uh, the first game of real-time strategies that looked like a real-time strategy game would be uh, Dune 2. And then uh, the guys at Blizzard did a game called Warcraft. And then we did Command and Conquer. So Command and Conquer was effectively the third RTS game in the world. Um, and the first one in the Command and Conquer series. Command and Conquer was conceived of as a trilogy. We were going to start with Tiberium Dawn then go to Tiberium Sun, and then ultimately Tiberium Twilight. We start off Command & Conquer 1 with this idea that as a kid in your bedroom with a computer and a modem, you were hacking into or becoming a remote commander of a battlefield. And so we wanted to deliver that as authentically as possible. So the, the idea that the screen would be full screen audio video was kind of a necessity because it was supposed to be tying into a real feed with a real person somewhere. Are you picking this up? With Tiberian Sun, we wanted to fast forward the world. So we wanted to advance that timeline several decades so we could do things like standing mechs that would walk around and stuff and do more science fiction. And then of course the world also had gone through a big transformation where Tiberian had infected most of the world. You had the GDI areas which were sort of safe zones and you had the infected wastes and mutants and all sorts of other things that we bring into the game. So it really added a lot of uh, texture to the story and added a lot of complexity to the kinds of things we could do with the characters. Command and Conquer was this idea of you're, you're being constantly pressed between having to make decisions to build up your economy while you're waging war. Oftentimes you're doing it while somebody else is doing the same thing on the other side. So it's this tension of preparing for battle, executing battles, and having to manage both the macro and the micro at the same time. The Blizzard games, the uh, StarCraft games, the Warcraft games, Age of Empires, all of those games lend themselves all the way back to the original Dune 2 or Command and Conquer. There's all these games that people play today, like League of Legends, and that would, simply wouldn't have existed if it wasn't for the talented team that uh, thought, what a crazy idea, let's make something really hard to do and make you put under pressure to time to do it. And that's where RTS got its roots. We always were looking at what was happening around the industry and saying, okay, that's an interesting innovation. We like that one, we don't like that one. One thing was there was a big problem was unit caps. We didn't want to have any unit caps. We liked the idea that people could build tons of units and go marching across the world and just mow everything down. That was lots of fun. So we were thinking about the game series as, hey, we'll look around the world, we'll look and see what other people are doing, and every time we saw some great innovation, we said, does that make sense for our series or not? And we were constantly editing what's in, what's out. Um, the way Westwood generally made products was, we started off with the high ideals of what we were trying to accomplish. This game is going to be about these things. And so for Tabri and Sun, it was uh, destructible terrain, it was real-time lighting, it was the sort of fantastic futuristic units. There was about five or six of these things that were just really kind of core tenets of what the game was going to be about. The single player experiences were ways of understanding the game. So by the time you finish the, the single player experience, each one of the units that we unlock is explored in a way that gives you an idea of how it functions, how you should use it, and how you shouldn't use it. But it also gives us an opportunity from a story point of view to put some meaning behind it. And I think that's something that um, we were particularly good at at Westwood. People cared about their Wolverines because they had the mission that made you care about the Wolverine as a unit, as a, as a thing. So later when you're playing multiplayer and you're throwing 50 of those at somebody, in the back of your head that still means something to you. The unit was more than just a bundle of stats. I kind of miss the fact that people don't tend to spend as much time anymore around the actual universe and the characters and the stories. They go, oh well, you know, it's just a shooter game, doesn't really matter. But as a player, I think it's really important to know your relationship with the game. Uh, it's not just about moving a mouse and a keyboard around. It's really about getting into the units and what they're there for and what their goals are. CNC in, in, in general always had a lot of technical problems that may be not obvious to people. Let, I'll start with the first one, uh, which is a big bucket called the CD-ROM. On my way. I can make it. Unit lost. 
So what really distinguished Command and Conquer from a lot of other games at the time was the use of the CD-ROM. Uh, CD-ROMs had just come out recently. They were single speed, and they were thought of as a big storage device where you could load a lot of stuff. But the speed of a CD is really, really slow. So there were only a few games that could figure out how to use this in a way that was effective. And we used it uh, so much that it ended up shipping the game with two CDs. That changed everything about how we thought about Command and Conquer. We went from one megabyte floppy to 700 megabyte CDs. So we had two 700 megabyte CDs to store stuff on. We actually consumed all of it virtually because we decided with Command and Conquer we were going to do full screen video and audio. Uh, and this was quite a challenge at the time. When you see Kane, Kane was not just the star villain of the series, he was actually our director and our producer for all of our video shoots. So we had this great talent in Joe. Why not bleed? Well, with Tiberian Sun, we really wanted to step up our game. We wanted A list, double A, triple A. So Michael Bain and James Earl Jones, I mean, these are top notch actors at the heyday of their careers. Let's kick some ass. So our compression technology for all the video that we did for the games, for cutscenes and such, had to be such that it would be able to be playable from a single speed CD-ROM. There were no third party codecs, even by the time Tiberian Sun, that could do that. So we had to create all of the video compression um, technology ourselves. We enlisted the aid of some people from a university, I think it was University of Washington, that worked on a thing called um, a vector quantization. We would take the video and slice it up into little blocks, and the individual blocks would be quantized into a single scalar value, and they would be put into a multi-dimensional cloud and reduced down to the one set of blocks that could represent the most number of other blocks reasonably well. And so for Tiberian Sun, we were able to get a much higher quality visual uh, with our technology than was available for uh, the same kind of data rates uh, as other things. There were certainly better codecs as far as like the total quality, but nothing that could run at the same speeds that ours did. So CD-ROM ended up being um, both a huge benefit because we could do these great sequences and also uh, an incredible um, torturous pain as a uh, thing to use because there were these this massive amount of data for the time and this little tiny straw that you had to sip everything through. So I guess the second big bucket I mentioned CD was one of them. The other one was just the idea that we had these realistic units. You have this imaginary space that's represented by mathematics and you need to move an object from one place to another. The simplest way, like if you've ever wanted to always solve a maze, you can just go to the right until you can't go to the right and eventually you'll find a way out of the maze. And if I said, take this unit to go from here to here and it went around the edges of the map all the time to get there, that would look ridiculous. You also can't just do a beeline because if you try to do a beeline, um, something might be in the way and you have to go around it. So you have to figure out how to do that. Where to? Because we had lots of choke points in the game and because you could de deform the terrain, you couldn't pre-calculate a lot of the pathfinding, so all the stuff was done in real time. So something like that doesn't seem like a big problem, but just the sheer computational need to calculate hundreds of units pathfinding is actually one of the things that brought all the CPUs down to their knees. The computational need to calculate all these possible branches, all these possible locations, becomes just too many computations, too big of tables, and it just brings the processors down. Even to this day, pathfinding is still a problem in every single game. In RTSs, it just happens to be a really hard problem because you have hundreds of units, especially C and C, and they all move in different kinds of ways, and the, the terrain that they're moving through can be very dynamic, and so it's changing all the time. Most pathfinding solutions that are fast rely on the fact that the things around them are not moving, and so you can do pretty good pathfinding node-based stuff. When a lot of stuff is moving and virtually everything is moving, um, it becomes really difficult. I think one of the other things that people underestimate is um, how hard you have to work to make a game not do something stupid, right? So the best part about artificial intelligence, if you want to call it that, is you just want to avoid art artificial idiocy. Pathfinding algorithms have this weird edge cases where something will thrash back and forth or it'll go up to an edge and it's clear that it should go one way but it goes all the way around another way. Those kinds of edge cases that do things that are really illogical ruin the game experience for a player because you get mad at the unit, you're going, what is this guy, just completely stupid, he's going the wrong way. What? You know, the player doesn't know how much work you've had to do to make it work. They just know what comes out. So I always tell people, it's like, well, if you spend more time just making sure it doesn't do something stupid, it'll actually look pretty smart. I think, you know, with Tiberian Sun, we really complicated some of the simple stuff in RTSs. Talk a little bit about pathfinding and that idea of finding your unit from one place to another. We make it really hard when the unit can suddenly burrow underground and one can't, or there's going to be a wall that pops up in increments. So when I go to test my path, the wall is there and then it's gone, and then it's there and then it's gone. So you have to know over time whether or not you're driving towards something you could go through. All these problems become really complicated. So there's all these algorithms out there. People can do it. You can implement it. You can have one unit go across the map and it looks great. When you start putting hundreds of units across the map and people fighting each other and trying to exploit the system, um, it becomes really problematic and it takes a ton of CPU time. I can fix that.
Bridge repaired. We start with a pathfinding saying any friendly unit that's moving with my guys that isn't stationary, assume those are not on the map and then do your pathfind. And that actually works kind of surprisingly well uh, because if they're moving, they're probably moving because you grabbed a bunch of units and told them to all go one place, so they're kind of probably all doing that anyways. And then the second tier to that was he said, okay, once we do that, if you run into something you can't move because there's a stationary unit that's a friendly unit, wiggle that unit a little bit. Make them move in one direction or another a little bit to see if it unlocks. And then there was a sort of series of decisions after that. So he sort of wiped out the edge cases one at a time. Like if there's a bunch of units and try to jam them over a bridge, they would keep shuffling and doing this kind of weird little dance and they would eventually get all the units over the bridge. Each each one of the layers that they added, starting with not considering friendly units that are moving when you're doing your algorithm for pathfinding so it's quicker, and then ultimately um, moving units around to try to get them through openings, and then um, finally, uh, if you just have to punt, find another way around the map. Those types of, of, of layer after layer after layer of innovations finally got the game to where, even with hundreds of units and with playing against another player with lots of different things happening, the train changing, um, most of the time the units did what you thought was fairly reasonable and logical, and so it became an acceptable thing. So the funny part about it is it's not trying to write a perfect pathfinding algorithm, it's about trying to write one that isn't stupid. These critters don't look too friendly. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of Tiberian Sun and shipping that one, it was a lot of work and hard, and there were a lot of folks at Westwood wanted to try some other things. And now that we were part of Electronic Arts, we had a lot of freedom to do other kinds of games. Uh, we were focused on a first-person shooter called Renegade, which is the Command & Conquer universe, a really fun game, by the way. And we were doing PlayStation 2 stuff and a lot of other things. So most of the team that had built Command & Conquer were off doing other kinds of games and stretching out into other genres. I guess what was really endearing about uh, Tiberian Sun for me, personally, was the team had taken a lot of risks and done a lot of new technology. It was really neat to see so many new innovations and so much new thinking get into a game and get out there. Even by that time, there were so many RTS Me Too's out there that so many games just copied everybody else's stuff. It was neat to see the team um, innovate in lots of ways that ultimately made it into other products as well. For me, it's always been very charming because it was probably the, well, it was definitely the last CNC made in Westwood Las Vegas and it was done in a way that was really um, a, a labor of love to do the best job we could with the franchise that we had built. Tibson really reached beyond uh, what anybody would have thought was rational at the time and tried to do some pretty innovative things. From all the RTSs that we built, the, my, I've often said my favorite one, Red Alert 2 with Yuri's Revenge, many of the things that that game did were facilitated by the innovations that were built by Tibri Sun. All the ideas about the veterancy of the units, the, the very tech itself, and just some of the thought process of design and how we would make these very different kinds of units interact with each other, these things um, were played out in full when a game could start from that basic baseline and built up instead of having to innovate everything. So for me, that's, it's always going to have a very special place in my heart. It's, it's sold very well and that's always important. And the, uh, the, the quality that people were putting in the game, they just made it very special. Objective complete.